Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Anur the Light. I'm back and oh so happy to be joining you once again as we take a look at the life of Muslim South Africa. I'm sure so much has happened in your lives just like in mine. Zaima Amin has traveled a long road and overcome many challenges to finally achieve a lifelong desire of becoming an artist. We brought you her story. Zaima Amin is the dynamic sculptor, captivating art audiences across the country. Her unique sculpted creations penetrate at a visceral level, and like any good artist, she draws inspiration from deeply personal wounds. If I have an idea, I try and read up about it, and that's where most of the information comes from. It's the research. So I read extensively. It's, I go through journal articles, as in academic journal articles, the newspapers, the internet, books, and then try and sort of distill all these ideas into an artwork. And then I try to find the material. Because material or objects are embedded with meaning. For example, if you were to take a plastic chair, that sort of has a meaning within it that we all understand it could be for a, a hall or it could be for functions. Then we take um, maybe a, a, an upholstered chair and, or you can take a, a grand chair or a dining room chair or you can take a, a chair which the king sits on which becomes a throne. So all these objects carry meaning. So I look at the objects which carry meaning that can inform my work. So in that way, I have a concept, I look for the material and then put that together and hopefully that can become an artwork. Rooted in creativity, Zyma was strongly influenced by her mother and grandmother who worked as seamstresses. She would often assist her grandmother in crafting lavish costumes for the then Nico Milan Theatre Complex, known today as the Artscape Theatre. My grandmother used to make all these wedding dresses and bahangsels and uh, headpieces and so on. And so we all, we, I grew up in a very making environment. And my mother also made all these things. My aunts, I think just about everybody around us made things. And we also had to sit and put in a, a bead here and there and so on. And so I grew up with the whole thing of just creating. A late bloomer in the arts, Zaima worked in the medical technology field for 15 years before finally pursuing her first love, completing a master's degree in fine art. She graduated in 2015 with a distinction, a feat which took her nearly eight years to achieve. After um, matric, my mother being a seamstress, my father was a carpenter, you know, studying was not actually one of those things that I could do. Uh, my mother said, this, what study, what are you crazy, what do you want to study for? Go and work. And um, I then got a job in a laboratory at um, medical school and they paid for me to study at Peninsula Technicon and that's when I did medical technology. I finished and then I had to work my contract but it's not something I really wanted to do and while I was working there I was still knitting and making things and so on. Nine years ago I started to study art, something that I think it was just, I was just drawn to it. Um, and also I wanted just a degree. I wanted a piece of paper to say, I, you know, I'm worth something. So um, then I started studying through UNISA and it took me six years, <clears throat> sorry, to get the degree and then two years at Michaela's to do the masters. Since then, Zyma's art has received numerous awards and accolades. In 2012, she won the PPC Cement Competition, and in 2016, Zyma claimed first place at the National Cecil New Signature Art Competition. Her artwork was selected as the winner from amongst 100 other applicants. I entered Cecil, and then, uh, besides all the other things that I did, and then I won the competition and it's for the artwork part of the master's called Paying Homage. Um, and it sort of launched this whole new art career, something I didn't, didn't know was going to happen. It wasn't part of the, the 
the whole idea of getting a degree. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been phenomenal. Uh, with, with Sassel, you get all these interviews and, and radio shows and things like that. So, I've, so it's about getting your name out there. Um, and it's happening faster than I imagined. The themes which Saima uses range from displacement to exploitation to identity, significantly influenced by the pain and trauma experienced by her family. Zaima has masterfully challenged their tragedy into personal triumph. I guess you're never too young or too old to find your happy place, just as Zaima has shown us. Here are some tips on books, tech and apps that are worth checking out. Former teacher and principal of the Strand Muslim Primary School, Ibrahim Broda, began to research and write about the history of the Muslims who settled in Strand after his retirement. At the age of 68, he received his master's degree. He writes a compelling account of the history of the Muslims who lived here because it isn't just an account of the mosques and historical structures, but an account of the people and their lives there. The Emberlite truly is an innovation with a purpose. Home automation is now coming in smaller and more accessible shapes and forms. The Emberlite simply connects to your phone and can be attached to various light fittings in your home and controlled from your cell phone. This can be used as a safety measure or simply so that you don't have to get out of bed in order to turn the lights off. It can be used as a light dimmer to set the mood in your home. This technology works with a simple installation of an app on your cell phone, available on both Android and iPhone. International Islamic scholar Ustada Yasmin Mujahid has released an Islamic audio app that has integrated with www.muslimcentral.com. As audio lectures are uploaded to the website, it will automatically become available via the app. No ads or in-app purchases allows you to listen without interruption. You can keep track and share the podcast you find interesting or simply listen online from wherever you are. Community service for doctors are mandatory and quite often they have to travel to another province to render this service. It's not easy to give up your familiar surroundings to do this, but there are many patients who greatly value the service they receive. Our topic this week looks at graduate doctors fulfilling their duty. In 1998, the Department of Health introduced compulsory community service for graduating doctors. This helped alleviate the need for medical doctors in communities where it was most needed. The only drawback has been that doctors don't get to choose where they go. It was difficult because um, before I had to start internship, I actually got married. So it was actually difficult for my family because not only did I now leave the house, I was going to move to another province entirely. And then obviously it now was a mission for us to pack all our things and then we had to drive down, get our things driven down as well. And like I said, when we moved here, we didn't know where we were going to stay. So we had to keep our things in holding until we found a place and things like that. So it was, it, it was a difficult process at that time. Yeah. It's difficult because obviously myself and everyone else would like to stay in the province that they want to be in or go to a province which they prefer to be in. But I do understand that obviously there aren't enough places for everyone to be in the most popular areas at the same time. So it's a, it's a difficult one. I understand, but I obviously wish that I could be back home. Tahira had just got married when she was informed that her posting was to Durban. This obviously put some pressure on the couple and there were choices to be made. So it was difficult for him as well because he had to quit his job and then came here, he didn't have a job at all and then it took him a few months before he could find a new one. But now that he's settled, Alhamdulillah, it's been okay. Um, it's just difficult because of my hours that I work, obviously. I'm either on call or then when I'm post call I'm extremely tired but the time that we do have together we enjoy. Uh, in the beginning it was very difficult 
Obviously, having something secure and to just leave it uh, and come without any offer in Durban. Uh, I just had faith in the Almighty and I knew that that was the right decision. And I knew that something will come up in Durban eventually. <laughs> and I mean, it took two months and then I started working again. So it was quite an easy transition. We wanted to get married uh, at the end of the year. So, and if she had to move, I was just going to move with her no <laughs> matter what. Mohammed Sheikh, on the other hand, is doing his medical studies in Cape Town. He hails from Escort in KwaZulu Natal and has made the city his home for the past three years. This will hopefully prepare him better for when it's time to do his community service. So, firstly, where I come from is a town called Escort in KZN Midlands. And it's somewhat semi-rural and a little bit of urbanization here and there. So I think I grew up with the smell of uh, coffee and uh, the aroma of coffee, you know, uh, spraying through the whole area, as well as uh, the odd occasion of cow dung and so forth. And I think that was the beautiful nurturing life that I did have. So the thought or the prospect of just moving to Cape Town itself was a bit daunting initially. Um, but I think there were a lot of uh, support structures that I did have in place to make my adjustments and make my move much more uh, easier. So in terms of the adjustments, I think the first for any healthcare practitioner, which is a common practice to be shunted away or pushed away into any part of the country, is the concept of family. A lot of times we are very close-knit to our family members, immediate and extended, and to move extremely far away from them, it loses the sense of, of belonging. Uh, um, there becomes a, a, a sense of emotional uh, degradation at times, especially due to the uh, extreme uh, course of medicine and uh, the, the work of doctors. So family, family is the first adjustment that I had to make. Like Mohammed, Tahira has also had to fit in and create a life outside of her own environment. Uh, friends, no, there's uh, good friends at work. But we don't really like socialize much on weekends. I think it's because of our times. So you're at work, you're working, then this one's on call, this one's post call, and then the little time that you have off you really want to spend with your family. Adjusting to a new city has its challenges, but as these young professionals show, it's being done. A few years ago, they were actually interning for uh, prospective uh, speakers as well as radio presenters, producers, co-hosts, etc. And I think I've been nurtured into public speaking for since I can remember, since a teenager or pro probably early in my later childhood. So this was something natural that did come into me. And I thought that um, let's let's give it a try at, at uh, somewhat, you know, at media, at uh, uh, presenting. And I think the first program that I did uh, at the Voice of the Cape was a program called Born to Serve. So it's basically featuring leaders in our community that are making a difference and uh, tapping them behind the scenes. Personally, it's helped me grow a lot in terms of, um, you know, just being a more relaxing nature. Some people love sitting at the beach and, you know, absorbing the sea waves. Some people love hiking. I like talking. Being forced, you know, out of your uh, comfort zone, it just forces you to adapt. So Durban has taught me that. And it also taught me that there's so much more to South Africa than Cape Town. You know, everyone says, oh, Cape Town is the most beautiful city, that's where you want to be. But Durban is really nice on its own, you know, so I'm actually glad in the end that I moved here, yeah. While there was pushback initially from doctors about their community service, one thing must be borne in mind. The benefits to both doctors and the communities are immeasurable. They get to help the most needy and in return increase their knowledge as well as skills in dealing with sick patients. The future for both looks bright. <laughs> There's still time for one last holiday before the holy month of Ramadan is upon us. In this week's travel segment, we explore beautiful Johannesburg. Deep in the heart of Lanasia is one of its best kept secrets. The shop is an institution of its own and offers home cooked meals in a traditional way. Fuss free but lip smacking good flavor. We make authentic halal food, uh, Indian cuisine the way your grandma used to cook, not your mum. And uh, it's old school. And it's a, a, a tradition that's dying. The youngsters don't cook curries anymore. 
and uh, everything's on a diet. That is why there's so much sicknesses around. So we cook proper food, and uh, we have a lot of customers that come in and buy because it's homemade and uh, it's what they used to. We make a different meal every day. Monday to Tuesday, we make different curries, different chicken dishes, sometimes a, a spaghetti dish, a butter dish, a, a chicken dish. Every Wednesday, we have curry kitchen. And once it goes out of fry, then on the side, we make fried fish, we make steak, we make um, a roast chicken or, or fish curry, it doesn't matter. Then every Friday, we have a soji, chicken dal and rice, and chicken biryani. And that is all sold out normally just before Juma. Fosia is passionate about food and uses only the best ingredients she can find. Her innovative menu caters to all her customers' needs by serving them food to feed their soul. Yeah, people love junk food. But we make roti wraps. We make sandwiches toasted. Uh, our chicken and steak is cooked in the best way possible, not just dumped in order to serve people food. They eat it and they're like, wow. You know, I make my own achars, I make my own sauces. Um, everything I do myself. And uh, I have help. But uh, takeaways, it is a healthier meal. This, this is definitely one place not to miss when next in Johannesburg. The drive out to Lanasia may be long, but the food that awaits is worth every minute spent on the road. The Johannesburg Botanical Gardens can be a lichen to the gold that the city is famous for. It provides the surrounding area with an escape from the hustle and bustle. We represent the, the flora of, 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 of South Africa because we've got indigenous plants and exotic plants which other gardens don't have. We've got the Shakespeare Garden where you can see the plants that are represented in the book of Shakespeare. We've got the rose garden with seven terraces and different kind of roses. We've got the Western Walk, one of our themed garden as well. And we've got herb garden where we've planted the medicinal plants and herbs. We also have the Vista area where you've got a view of Emarincha Dam, where you can come and just picnic with family. We open from six to six. There's a whole lot of things that people can do in the garden. We've got cyclists, we've got a cycling route. We've got areas where you can come and have your exercises in the morning and just walks in the morning and listen to the birds. Numerous water features can be found in and around the gardens, providing an abundance of this life substance. We have several water features in the rose garden, which are man-made. They just make a beautiful background if you're taking pictures. We've got weddings that are held there and there are people who just come to take pictures for their wedding. But school groups come for research purposes and also just to relax. And to use our facility, you need to book. If you are more than 20 in a group, you need to complete an application form, which is available on our website. A visit here is good for both mind and soul and offers complete serenity in the midst of the city. The history of human beings on Earth is both fascinating and interesting, and so much is being learnt about the oldest beings to walk the Earth. So the Origin Centre is unique in that it is basically a celebration of humanity. It's a celebration of our evolution. It's a celebration of the uniqueness of South African history. Um, it is the only museum in the world that celebrates modern humans. Um, and that's what it is. It's a collection of our cultural evolution, the evolution of our people, our rock art, all housed in, in one fantastic exhibit. The way the, the exhibits are set up here, it's almost as if you're taken through a journey of what it means to be human. So we start off with the very beginning. So modern humans emerged about 200,000 years ago. Um, 300,000 if, if we take into consideration the Moroccan fossils. Um, and you start with the development of stone tools and innovations and these different stone tool industries that we can track at different localities in South Africa. Um, and then we come through to the more modern human aspects with cultural evolution and we see that in our amazing rock art, um, trance dancing, celebrations of koi and sand traditions. And then we go through to the more modern aspects of South African um, 
history, your Kusara Bartman, the genocides of the, the Khoi and the San communities, and into a celebration of all the cultures we, we now have in our country. So we have a, a beautiful exhibit where you get a chance to see different initiation rites for, for different um, cultural groups. Uh, so yeah, it, it takes you through an entire journey from 200,000 years until now. So opening times are 10 to 5 every single day, and that's from Monday to Saturday. We also do host um, talks. So we have public lectures, and if you follow us on any social media, you'll be able to keep up with that. We're on Facebook, you can, you can check us on Facebook, where we will let you know when we're having certain uh, guest speakers. Those tend to be authors of books. Um, just popular topics that are, are, are going around in archaeology, in human evolution, in anything to do with, with humanity. Alhamdulillah, the first show is in the bag and it's time for us to go. Kinna Mare Mokwanda, kere aripuwe ning ribora neng khape. Assalamu alaikum.